Creeks Department Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, February 20th, 2013. Call it to order. Um, Jan, would you please uh, do roll call for us? Mr. Bullock? Here. Ms. Weber? Ms. Lomas? Mr. Smith? And we have Ms. Alley? Thank you. Um, if everyone's had a chance to look through their packet, um, look at the minutes from December 12th, 2012, if there's any comments or changes. If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve those. I'll make a motion to approve them. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Are there any adju adjustments to today's agenda, Cameron? Uh, no adjustments, Mr. Chair, but I... Um, at our last meeting in December, we had representatives from the Urban Creeks Council and from the Environmental Defense Center uh, come during public comment and ask to talk about a uh, project they're working up in Rattlesnake, working on up in Rattlesnake Creek. And um, Mr. Moldaver had asked that I invite them to be on the agenda for this meeting, and I did. Uh, I did call and speak with uh, Mr. Frickman from the Urban Creeks Council and with Brian Troutwine from the Environmental Defense Center, and they declined to be on the agenda, but they did want to come tonight to speak during public comment just to let you know what they're working on up there. So I think they're, I think they're here for that, but I wanted to let you know that's why that's not on the agenda. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So then moving on to public comment. Anyone here would like to talk? For two minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is Rick Frickman, Urban Creeks Council, and we are working on the barrier removals on Rattlesnake Creek. Uh, it's working. Okay. Uh, at the a couple of months ago, you may remember we came before the board, and uh, Mr. Moldever suggested we be on the on the agenda, and doing research uh, and preparing for this. Uh, this month, I th uh, and talking with Cameron, we thought, well, maybe we don't have anything to ask of the, the Creek Committee at this at this moment, so we uh, had it off the agenda. But since talking with N Natasha, she said that there may be some things in the future that we need to have the Creeks Committee uh, work on. I, so I just want to take this time to bring you up to date what's happening with that pipe. I don't have any uh, slides, but if I could give you the On uh, page two of the uh, uh, paper I handed out, there's a picture of the pipe in question. It's a it's the original pipe from the Mission Tunnel down to the Sheffield Reservoir, but in '64 uh, it was abandoned when they put the Cater water treatment plant in. So now it's uh, not being used. Uh, Kathy Taylor from the City uh, Water Resources came out, looked at it, and she said, as far as she's concerned, the pipe can be removed. So I've been uh, uh, talking with uh, Fish and Wildlife, and we're trying to find a grant to uh, take it out. We have a bid already on that, and I think that's moving forward. Uh, Natasha just told me that there's probably some permits that the city would require that uh, perhaps City Creeks Division uh, could uh, suggest or help to facilitate uh, that permit. So that's. That's sort of the status on that. I guess there's more discussion later on today on uh, on the uh, steelhead in the creek. Rattlesnake's a great creek. It has a wonderful habitat up there that I'm, well, hopefully systematically we can move upstream and get there, uh, get the fish back. And I was, I was just thinking coming down here that uh, Capistrano may have its swallows, but I think in a couple of years people will be coming to Santa Barbara to watch the, the fish swim back upstream again. Thanks. Thanks. That would be wonderful. <clears throat> um, next item. Oh, could, 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 could I also make one brief comment? I, I want to apologize to the uh, committee for being uh, a couple of minutes late. I was coming back 
uh, from our friends at City College. And I wanted to remind uh, everyone on the committee as well as people at home that Friday, March 15th is the uh, kickoff for the annual uh, student uh, uh, scholarship and support drive. And there's going to be a wonderful friend raiser there. So I brought some uh, uh, festive uh, invites for everyone here. And I hope uh, anyone who's at home who's interested would uh, check the website for the Foundation for City College. Uh, and that's why I was late. Sorry. Thanks, Lee. <clears throat> All right, item number six, the committee member, staff communications. Cameron, anything? Uh, the only thing I have, Mr. Chair, is that the budget subcommittee uh, of this committee met on um, last Wednesday, February 13th, for its first budget subcommittee meeting of the year. And we will have a second meeting sometime probably the second or third week of March. Okay. So the next item is to um, elect a vice chair for the <coughs> upcoming year. And um, I understand we have a volunteer. Danielle? Yes, I'll volunteer. Okay. <coughs> so um, we need to move, move to nominate uh, Danielle DeSmith as vice chair for the year 2013 14. Thank you. And do we need a second? I'll second that. <laughs> All right. And voting, Jan? Okay. Can we see if there are any other uh, interested candidates who want to throw their I Steve uh, not here hair well. beret into the ring? <clears throat> All right. So all in favor of Danielle becoming the vice chair for this upcoming year? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to hand over uh, to Betsy. Will you take over the meeting? Sure. Thank you. The new chairperson of the board. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, all right, we're going to move along to business items. And the first agenda is um, a presentation from Browning Allen with the transportation on the street sweeping program. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Browning Allen, the transportation streets and parking manager in the Public Works Department, and with me is uh, Nick Cabugos. He's the uh, supervisor, and he supervises the street sweeping program as well as other folks in the uh, Public Works street maintenance uh, section of my division. So let me, so I'm gonna quickly go through the over, an overview of our street sweeping program, and I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the financials of the, the program, but um, our current uh, street sweeping program uh, prior to 2002, uh, we were only uh, doing the sweeping in the commercial area. And then in January of 2002, we started a pilot program uh, in the residential area on the west side. And then in October of 2003, we expanded the street sweeping program over into the east side. And then the following year, we did another expansion into the upper east, uh, the west side, and the um, parts of the west side, as well as the uh, San Marcana area. And then 2006, we went up to the Lower Mesa, Hidden Valley, Campanel Hill, and then 2007, the um, Upper Mesa, TV Hill in the July, and then in final expansion area was in the San Roque neighborhood in 2008. Um, our commercial area, which was our original area where we were doing the sweeping, got 80 curb miles uh, in the downtown commercial area that we sweep. Um, in the business area, industrial areas, overall 80 curb miles, 15.5 in the downtown core, 65 miles on the arterial swept, streets are swept on a, a weekly basis. We do sweep the downtown four nights a week, and the commercial area is done mostly at night because it's a pretty active uh, area. In the residential area, it's weekly on the east side, the west side, and the west beach area. Uh, all the other areas in the city we do uh, twice a month. In the first area of the west side in the west downtown, we have uh, 55 curb miles. It's heavily populated. We have a lot of cars parked, uh, a lot of um, dense trees. Um, and the area is this area here. This is the first area we did with the uh, commercial, uh, with the residential sweeping. And the east side, yeah, when we started that in uh, 2003, this is east side, and we added this little small, um, small portion over here. About 49 curb miles that we're sweeping. 
In the um, Upper East Side, we did that expansion in 2004. It's the um, inclusive parts of the West Side that we weren't doing in the the first area, as well as the West Beach. We have um, 45 curb miles. Every area has parking enforcement except for the Upper East Side. That was the first area where we started experimenting with not putting no parking restrictions on every single street. And that was primarily at the request of the residents who didn't want to have a lot of no parking signs in front of their homes. So it was an experiment, and it turned out it was work, it's, uh, working quite well in that neighborhood as we carry that theme on into the, the future expansion areas. So in 2006, we did the Lower Mesa Hidden Valley and the Campanile Hill. It's 40, 54 um, curb miles, and these are the areas here. Um, again, uh, no parking restrictions except for a few streets where it's heavily parked or it's adjacent to a commercial area. And then 2007, the Upper Mesa um, and Port Swell area, Bel Air, TV Hill, again, 42.8 uh, curb miles. You know, same thing with the um, parking restriction. Primarily, if we have it heavily parked or if it's adjacent to a commercial area where some of the commercial parking spilling over into the neighborhood. And just to kind of back up a little bit, in the neighborhoods where we're not par um, having parking restrictions, if we're able to sweep successfully at least 80% of the curb mile, then we're good. We won't look at doing any uh, parking restrictions. We've only had to do a couple of minor tweaking since we started doing the limited parking restriction in those these neighborhoods. Uh, 2008 was the San Roque neighborhood. I think everybody's familiar with that area. 60.4 uh, curb miles swept twice a month. Again, only doing the enforcement in, on the streets where we have apartment buildings or, or streets that are adjacent to State Street where we know we're going to have some issues with um, uh, parking and parking all day long. Again, all of our residential street sweeping is during the day, uh, daytime hours where most people are either at work or at school. Again, so overall, we are sweeping 80% of the city, either via the commercial or the residential um, sweeping routes. The areas that we are not sweeping is primarily in the Mission, in the um, Riviera area, and it's not that there's not a need up there, it's just because the terrain is such where it's not safe to sweep up there. It's hilly, curvy, it's really not safe having a street sweeper on those roads going approximately six to eight miles an hour. It's just really not something that we felt was, were comfortable. If we have an issue up there, we have done special sweeps from time to time to take care of issues, but overall, we didn't feel comfortable with it. So 80% of the city is really good, very successful in our sweep, uh, street sweeping program. It's not. A, it's kind of hard to see this picture. This is an example of uh, what we're pulling uh, um, off the road. Uh, a lot of vegetation, leaves, dirt. Uh, we do pull a lot of bottles and paper uh, products uh, out as well. Um, stuff that normally would be flowing into the storm drains. We're getting off the streets. Um, this in last year, last calendar fiscal year, we had 1.8 tons or 3.69 million pounds of debris that we removed off the streets. This, that's citywide for our entire street sweeping program. In this photograph here, you can see a plastic bottle here, some papers, a um, variety of stuff. Uh, we do have you know, parking enforcement. Parking enforcement is helping support this, uh, this program. Uh, we have uh, three parking enforcement officers that we pay for out of this program. You know, Here's a sample of the uh, no parking sign. Um, one neighborhood, um, let's see, which one is this one? The San Bernican area. This one was a very interesting neighborhood where the residents didn't want uh, no parking signs on all their streets, even on the corners of the streets. So we tried to experiment in this neighborhood, so we did parking restriction for the entire neighborhood. And we just posted every interest into the neighborhood with parking restrictions. And we've mm. only had a couple of issues where people who were visiting didn't see the sign. and. Uh, one of them actually went to court, and the judge sustained the parking citation. So it's working quite well in this neighborhood. Um, this here just gives a, a quick uh, look-see of um, the parking citations. So in 2003, the police department issued uh, 2,914 tickets. The high was in uh, FY5, uh, where they issued 34,000-plus parking citations. And then last fiscal year, it's about 25,000 uh, parking citation, and it's leveling off. It's maybe tailing down a little bit. 
not sure of why the number of parking citations has gone down. I would like to say people finally got wise and aren't parking their vehicles on the streets. Uh, the parking ticket last fiscal year was $48 for a parking citation. When we started the program in 2003, they were $35. So when you're starting to approach $50 for a parking ticket, it's getting expensive. Uh, I know uh, we had one individual who was got a parking ticket every single week. You know, she lived over in the west side, $35. She said that was just the cost for living in the, in the downtown area. At $48 a parking ticket, I'm not sure she's getting that. Uh, one antidote, though, with the uh, street sweeping program, we did see because of uh, having the enforcement in some of the neighborhoods that the number of abandoned vehicles or inoperable vehicles on the city streets has gone down quite a bit because if you get five unpaid parking tickets, the car got towed. So that was a very beneficial part of the program as well. So in 2003, when we first started the program, they were enforcing 55 curb miles. Currently, they're enforcing 146 curb miles. We don't see the number of curb miles changing anytime soon. It's working pretty well. Uh, it's We've made, again, like I mentioned earlier, we've made some minor tweaking to the, the curb mile, but overall, it's working pretty well. We're getting really good compliance in the neighborhoods where we've asked for the residents to voluntarily not park on the street during street sweeping hours. And we know if we have a street where there's a problem, where cars are there all the time, before we go out and put a sign, we're going to send a notice to the residents to ask them to cooperate with us. Wow, this is going to be hard to read. Hmm. Let me pull up my copy. Of it. Yep, hard copy for them. Well, let me. Not a problem. Okay. It is uh, brought back to the city yard, and we let it dry out, and then uh, Marburg comes to pick it up for us. And you know, all the green waste and all that is, is composted. Oh, we can move it around a little bit. Okay. Thank you. So this might be a little hard for you, so... Let me just start over here in the uh, column over on your on your left. So we currently have 1.4 FTE equivalent that are being paid out of the street sweeping program. Nick is in the program. We have a couple other people in the program. We have um, a, two contracts for sweeping. Our, our street sweeping is done primarily by, by contract. We have one street sweeper that the city owns, and we do use that for special sweeps and a couple of commercial areas where uh, we do it ourselves for but 99% of the street sweeping is done by contract. So the commercial contract <coughs> for FY13 is, um, number doesn't look right, 125, and for residential is 205. And it's going up to 211 for 14 and 217 for um, FY15. This number here does not look right, but it's going to be one. Both these numbers don't look right, Nick. The commercial, the commercial is dropping next year. Yeah, so, okay, the commercial probably look like it's dropping a little bit. I know there's some interest into where the money comes from in terms of the program. So um, the primary source of revenue for the street sweeping program is parking citations. Um, So the top line here is the parking citation violation starting in FY9. Just give a, a short history. We're at 760. 
Uh, it's been going down pretty consistently for the last few years, uh, projecting it going up just a slight for FY um, 13, um, and then starting to drop again, you know, or remaining kind of flat uh, for the years uh, out. You know, it's a hard one to anticipate. You know, people don't want to pay fifty dollars when they get a parking ticket. So uh, we, you know, we've seen better compliance when we first started the program. Uh, we do have get money coming in from streets program to pay for uh, the street sweeping program, and then the Measure B money that comes in from the Creeks program also goes in to support the program. The expenses uh, for the program we have salaries and benefits. We have what we call materials and supplies. The contracts are in this number, and then we have materials and supplies that we have to uh, purchase to support the program. Like I mentioned, we have our own street sweeper, so we have to pay for fuel and maintenance of the sweeper. Um, there are brooms and other mechanical parts on the sweeper that we have to purchase on a regular basis and keep the machine uh, operating. Uh, the allocated cost is the number we get from the finance department. It's the overhead that we have to pay you know, to the finance department, which includes um, uh, liability and workers' compensation insurance. And I think I think you might have seen some of those numbers yourself for uh, your program as well. Um, special projects, we don't have any money budgeted for, um, you know, the current fiscal year or the last fiscal year for special projects. You know, over the last couple of years, I've been trying to trim the amount of money we've been having to spend in this program because the revenues were going down. So I eliminate the, um, the special project uh, line out, and then we move some personnel costs out of the program, too, just to save costs because the program was um, – uh, revenues were, uh, were quite a way off. Um, in 2009, there was we did have a pretty healthy reserve fund in the street sweeping program, and the city council elected to take a uh, million dollars in FY9 to help with the general fund budget issue. And then we do pay the police department for doing their parking enforcement, and so that money comes out of the program too. So if you look here down on the bottom line, so this number here was just primarily in Monday I went to the, uh, help offset the cost uh, for the, uh, the general fund budget issue. But in FY10 and 11, we actually had to use whatever was the, most of the balance in our reserve fund just to keep the program up and running at the, at the level that was at. In the last fiscal year, they're just in it, and we're projecting in FY13 uh, being able to start rebuilding a reserve fund so we have money in case the revenues don't come in like they had been coming in, in prior years. And it's coming on over. And so we're projecting at the end of this fiscal year, we'll turn back to the fund balance about $66,000. But we're not projecting, uh, we're only projecting $15,000 for FY14 and $8,500 for FY15. We're primarily because the expenses are going up and the police department costs have gone up too. So we have to account for those those numbers as well. And go back to that PowerPoint. No, that's not working. There we go. Yeah. So I just want to show this slide to the, the committee. So this just shows what our, our reserves were. So we had a pretty healthy uh, reserve fund for prior to FY12, and this is showing from 12 going on up. Where we're actually showing, showing being able to get our reserve up to a decent level, of, you know, right around $180,000. But we're showing that our reserves are going to start dipping down again, where we're going to be out of out of reserves in FY19 if something doesn't change. Um, which means I'm going to have to start making some other adjustments in, in the program. We're cutting, figuring out a way to cut costs or increase revenues. And I know increasing the uh, the cost for parking citations really is not a way to increase revenues because you get over $50, more people are going to stop parking on the street because they're not going to want to pay $55 or $60 for a parking citation. You get to a point in time where it's not cost effective to raise your parking citations. So that's just a quick overview of our program. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And Nick is here, too. He can ask any, answer any operational questions you might have as well.
Thank you very much for that presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Sure. Um, I do have a question um, about the uh, parking citation revenue. So you said that in fiscal year 2012, you have approximately 25,000 tickets that were given out mm -hmm. and are around approximately $50 a ticket. That's a revenue of like one and a quarter million dollars. But on your slide, it showed 600 approximately 600000 for revenue. Do you yeah. pay that to the police department as well as hire them to give the tickets? Yeah, the way it works is we... Sorry. We get... It's an ETV. <laughs> <laughs> so of the $48 or $50 per parking citation, we actually get $32 that actually comes into our program. The police department keeps... Uh, a certain amount of money, and the courts get a, uh, uh, a dollar amount as well. So even though it's $48 for parking citation, uh, we only get 32 of it. That's why the number is not e equaling out. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Allen. It's very, very informative. Uh, given their reputation for generosity, uh, do you think as the California economy recovers, that the uh, money that the administrator and the finance department borrowed from your reserves uh, may begin to uh, uh, trickle back as they recognize that everyone has tightened their belts for five years and uh, as bed taxes, sales tax, and uh, property transfer tax uh, recover, that uh, rather than put it all in the general fund reserve, they may want to uh, return some of it to individual uh, programs that chipped in when the going was hard? I don't have an answer to that question. That would be, could be a recommendation, obviously, from this committee or the downtown parking committee for their funds, but, you know, that's really up to the uh, mayor and city council. How many sweepers are there in the city? Well, we have one city-owned sweeper, and the contractor, he, in any given day, he has a fleet. Yeah. You know, because he's doing um, some days a week, he's doing several areas at, at the same time, so he has a fleet. But we actually have one that we own, that, that we have out from time to time. I'm assuming that the sweepers after the parades are from a different fund, correct? After, this, like, the, the Fiesta Parade. The street sweeper, uh, when we sweep after the parade, uh, we do a combination of our own sweeper as well as a contractor and it's, and it's part of the their uh, contract to take care of it yeah, I'm just curious about the the amounts paid in from streets and parks and rec and you also said that that you received measure B funds are those in the p and r numbers yes that's the p and r number that is, but that, that is, is the number mm -hmm. ah okay and so it it's going up, I see, each year from fiscal year 09, the transfer in from Parks and Rec. So from 09, 172.2 thousand to projected fiscal year 15, 203.2. But the transfer in from the streets um, as of fiscal year 10 on through 15 is an even 150,000. Is there a reason why the amount coming out of Measure B funds is increasing every year? But the amount coming out of the streets fund stays the same. Well, there was a decision um, by um, my boss's boss and council to increase the amount of money coming from Measure B by a, an inflationary amount every every year. The reason the number for the um, streets fund has been in flat is we have a huge problem with streets fund, where we can't, where we don't have enough money to do the infrastructure needs that we have identified. So our streets capital fund is really in. In dire straits. All we're doing right now is just basic maintenance. We're not doing anything new. In fact, in terms of payment maintenance, we're not putting as much money as we really should be putting on an annual basis. So that's why it's been been flat. It's a budgetary issue. Hmm. Does anyone have any further questions? I I've, would you mind pulling that PDF back up the chart? Or oh, never mind. I've got it here too. Yeah. I was just curious, it sounds like you're expressing the need to build up the reserves and for street sweeping, but the million that went out in FYI09 
can you tell me what that was used? Was that used for water quality then, or what was that used for then when it was transferred out of? It, it looks like it went into the general fund. It went into the general fund to help with the uh, budget uh, deficit that the general fund was facing to help balance the budget. So across the board, not necessarily for. I couldn't say specifically what program they used it for, but one of the general fund as a balancing uh, measure. They had a, a chart that had different measures to uh, address the general fund budget shortfall and taking uh, the money out of the reserve fund was one of the things that the council elected to do. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, uh, along the same lines, the Public Works Department is uh, uh, justly respected for their ability to uh, gather and analyze data. And uh, I imagine that there are uh, probably some trend lines that have developed in which uh, sweeping areas tend to generate uh, the largest volume and, chemically speaking, the largest amount of noxious materials collected. And I know that not all neighborhoods and arterials are equal. So it could be that uh, if your projection, which I pray is uh, not correct, uh, uh, finds your reserves starting to go down again, that uh, another logical option uh, to consider for the program along the same lines that uh, Danielle raised about uh, Measure B for creeks and watersheds paying more money than the streets program to keep the streets clean would simply be to uh, apprise uh, the Council Budget and Finance Committee that some neighborhoods may not need uh, twice a month cleaning and they could go to once a month uh, and concentrate all the resources financially that you do have uh, into the areas that are generating the largest volume and the most noxious mix uh, of waste. So you'd be getting the largest bang for your buck and keep the street program um, uh, doing uh, intersections and potholes and maintenance, uh, which is what it was designed for. Well, that's something that, you know, uh, even a couple of years ago when we were evaluating uh, making changes, if we were running out of reserve funds, we would have to definitely have to take a look. We looked at the commercial as well as the areas where we were doing the non-enforced sweeping. You start uh, making adjustments or changing the frequency in the enforced areas, and you have a, a corresponding reduction in revenue as well. You know, so we definitely are you know take a look at the frequency of the sweeping. Like I should tell the committee though, the amount of debris that we are collecting on the road has not changed significantly since we began the program in each of the areas. So believe it or not, we're still having the same amount of debris. And a lot of it is um, it's vegetation, but we do have a lot of trash, especially on the west side, because it's a, the west side is a heavily, west downtown is a heavily parked uh, neighborhood. So we have a lot of uh, litter from uh, people who are parking their cars there. But, you know, the amount of debris really hasn't dropped significantly since we started the program. Um, also, Mr. Moldaver, in response to that um, that question and the comment, um, I, just a recent uh, issue of this Stormwater Magazine came out, and on the cover is uh, street sweeping and talking about enhancing the performance for water quality. And um, the the article is reporting on a study that was done by the City of San Diego, and it's a multi-year study where they looked at a lot of different variables in terms of street sweeping program from a water quality perspective. The City of San Diego's street sweeping program is, is really a, it's a water quality BMP for, for, the, uh, for that city. And they looked at things like the frequency of sweeping. Um, they looked at the type of machines that were being used. There's, there's about three different types of, uh, of street sweeping designs. Um, they looked at the speed that the sweepers were moving. And then they looked at one other variable was sweeping in the medians, not just along the, the curb and gutter. And they found that, you know, for different slopes and for, for different um, uh, types of uh, situations in the, in the street, different approaches were more, uh, more or less effective. And so, um, you know, when you're looking at, at what we just saw in the city's program, we have some areas of the city that are being swept four, t four days a week and other areas that are being swept every other week. And so... Um, from a water quality perspective, I don't think that would be the most efficient approach. So there are other reasons that the city is doing street sweeping um, besides water quality. And so, uh, you know, if, if that were applied more equally, it's not just some areas are going to have more garbage in the streets or something like that. It's, if, you're, if you're looking at the water quality uh, improvement, you would, you would probably distribute more equally. And... Um, 
maybe wait different times of the year. You're going to get much, uh, much more bang for your buck from a water quality perspective if you're doing it during the storm season because you're, you're eliminating all that debris before it gets washed in, where during dry weather you don't get as much of a water quality bang. So, um, so there has been a, a pretty detailed and lengthy study on, on how to fine-tune a program for a water quality benefit. And, and just for the um, committee's uh, information, so when we started the program, we got Measure B monies to go towards the program, and it's applied to the residential sweeping, which is either weekly or, or twice, a, twice a month. The commercial was done on um, four times or multiple times. That's where the streets money is going to support that program. Um, so you mentioned that there's um, the enforced areas and then the non-enforced areas. Correct. So then the non-enforced areas, if you do come across a vehicle that is parked during a street sweeping day, that car does not get um, a, a ticket? That's correct. Okay, so there's potential untapped revenue in those areas, but obviously there would be some residents that might be concerned with the signage and the 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 parking violations uh, coming their way, but that is a... Yeah, it was a trade-off, and we did an experiment in the Upper East Side to see if, how successful we would be by not having enforcement on every single street. And the goal we said is we could, if we could sweep 80% of the curb mile, that's pretty doggone good. You know, so if it's only one car, and hopefully it's not parked there every two weeks, and if it is, we ask the operator to let, to let Nick or Georgia know in streets so we can let the uh, property owner know, the resident know, hey, can you move your car to the other side of the street so we can you know, sweep the streets? But we asked them to, to police themselves and remind their neighbors not to park on the street. And overall, we're being uh, pretty successful. You know, to try and do in the enforcement again, so you know, our costs would go up, so we have to add more parking enforcement officers. And we kind of looked at, you know, in fact, Nick and, and the operator uh, the owner of the company, they drove every, they, when we added an area, they drove every single street. So they saw how many cars were parked on the street to determine whether or not we needed to do, needed to do enforcement. So in your example, if there may be one or two cars parked in the street, it wasn't really cost effective to do the, the enforcement. You said the Measure B money is, is mainly funding the residential sweeping and the streets money is mainly funding the commercial That's sweeping? Correct. So has there been a determination that there's a higher correlation uh, to water quality improvement with sweeping in residential areas as opposed to commercial areas? Well, the, the residential area is bigger, obviously, than the commercial area, and, and, and the majority of the debris we're removing from the street is in the residential area because we're that's where you know the people live. We've got a lot, a lot of trees. If you look at the west, uh, west downtown area, heavily... Um, vegetated, a lot of trees, a lot of debris were remo removing from those those streets. So we haven't done an actual, like, um, sat down with Cameron and his staff to do a water quality analysis, but we, I can just tell you by the debris removal that we're pulling off the various neighborhoods, you know, we're getting, we are getting a good bang for a buck in the in the residential areas. And the time of the year, we it's pretty consistent year-round in terms of the amount of debris. We try and get out there and sweep before a, a rain event, but like yesterday, when it rained, there's water in the in the gutter. Sweeper's not out there because all they're doing is sucking up water. Mm -hmm. You know, so. And, but then we will come back. Hopefully, the following week, there's going to be a lot of stuff on the on the roadway. We want to um, you know, pick it up before the next rainy event, so it doesn't you know, flow into the the storm drains. Are you familiar with the the study? I'm and I'm not that that Cameron mentioned that the city of I San have not Diego seen the study. Done. All right. Um, so, with the contract for the the guy that has a fleet of sweepers, does he take care of the trash disposal, and, and or is he just sweeping up, and then the city pay or your department pays for the? Disposal? He brings it back to the city yard and dumps it. We let it stay there and, and dry out a little bit because because it's you know, it's wet because we have to put water on to reduce the amount of. Uh, uh, dust. Yeah. People complain about dust. And then Barbara comes over and picks it up, and we get a certain amount of tonnets per year for free. So most uh, most of it is, is collected at, at no additional charge to the city. Okay. Because is it necessary to have a city-owned sweeper? Because I, I'm looking at the numbers, and I see 
the contract sweepers approximately three hundred thousand a year. You you pay the police department three hundred thousand, and you get revenue from the parking violations of six hundred. So that's kind of a wash. And then Measure B contributes one hundred eighty-five thousand. So is the having the city-owned sweeper um, w the reason that your budget is so much higher? Because if the guy with the contract could do it for six hundred thousand, why not sell him your sweeper? This this our city sweeper does is really not um, the problem. There, the problem is the amount of money that's being transferred out for you know, parking enforcement and, and the overhead. You know. You know, we're about due to replace a sweeper. We're evaluating whether or not it's, it's a good thing to continue to have a sweeper. We always do that before we buy a heavy piece of equipment. Cause it's, you know, it's a you know, $200,000 piece of equipment. <clears throat> but we look at the benefit of having a sweeper. You know, we do special sweeps. If something comes up where we need to go in, people are, you know, like in the upper Riviera area, you know, we'll do that, you know, do special sweeps. So we're, we are evaluating whether or not we're going to replace that sweeper. But overall, the bottom line, it's not going to be a substantial reduction in the bottom line. You know, it's primarily where we're going to see see the savings is in the some of the supplies that we have to buy um, for the sweeper, you know, like the brooms and belts and that type of stuff for the city-owned sweeper. I had one more question. Just looking here at the spreadsheet again, um, I'm noticing that the the revenue coming in from parking violations, you're projecting that it's going to be flat for the next few years mm -hmm. here but the cost to the police department is increasing and there's actually a fairly significant jump there but I'm wondering what what why are you guys paying such a significant amount more all of a we, sudden when you're get not that, getting more in we get that number from the finance department so that's the number they gave us that we have to pay the police departments so we have to pay for the free parking enforcement officers we have to pay for the maintenance of the uh, the vehicles that are used for the enforcement as well as their overhead to uh, supervise the, the um, parking enforcement uh, program. So we really don't have any control over that number. And so we don't have control over that number. We don't have any control over the uh, allocated over costs. The only thing we have control over is is our maintenance materials and supplies and the contract and our salary and benefits. And I've already made adjustments to the salary and benefits. And we went out to bid um, two years ago for a street sweeping uh, contract. And we actually got a lower number than we were paying the year with the, the previous contract. So we were able to reduce our costs that way as well. So every five years, we four to five years, we go out to bid. Madam Chair, I have a, a recommendation, either for maybe for a recommendation this evening, or maybe we can vote on an action next month. But it seems that if such a significant portion of this program is being funded by Measure B, that that we should be talking about the most efficient ways that it be done in order to improve water quality and I believe Mr. Allen you said that you hadn't yet spoken with Mr. Mr. Benson about coordinating or or evaluating the policies like they did in the city of San Diego is that right yeah before I even want to entertain something like that I would want to read that study and sit down with my staff I, yeah and I think we would yeah. too so maybe so we can I think it's probably maybe premature at this point in time I really would like to have an opportunity to review it first before absolutely yeah. absolutely but it seems like something we should do Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Thank you very You're much. You're quite welcome. Um, all right. Next, we're moving on to a presentation by George Johnson on the Steelhead Passage Project. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be talking about uh, Mission Creek and some fish passage projects we've been working on for the last four or five or maybe six years now. Um, how do I get this thing to on the right? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so project purpose, we'll just go over that real quick. Uh, the basic idea all these projects we'll be talking about this evening is to improve steelhead trout migration. And we want to try to get steelhead back up to the creek so they can migrate. Right now, there's some pretty significant barriers on Mission Creek, and they can't get up there. And the, I guess the uh, the... The real number we're looking for is how many miles of habitat can we get these fish to. And with the series of projects that we're implementing, we hope to get about four miles of habitat, of which two are good for spawning um, 
and uh, and uh, raising the young fish. So that's kind of the purpose. All right, there. Um, uh, steelhead trout, I'll just briefly go over them. They're kind of an unusual species. Uh, you've probably heard of rainbow trout or coastal rainbow trout. Uh, they're the trout that live in our creeks, and you typically you can see them in the upper watershed. Um, steelhead are the same species. They're not any different, except that for some reason, and scientists don't know why, the steelhead will go to the ocean and, and eat food out there and then come back to spawn, while other uh, trout that live in the stream will live their whole life cycle within the, the stream itself and will not migrate to the ocean. And so because of that, these fish are able to get big, those that migrate to the ocean, and that's what's typically referred to as a steelhead. They'll get any, they get up to like 42 inches in some big streams in Northern California, so they get to be really big fish. And when they come back, uh, they come back to their streams and migrate. They can also do this more than once in their lifetime, which is different from salmon, which die after they spawn. Uh, these fish have pretty special habitat requirements. They need nice, clean water. They need it to be cool and cold so that... Uh, they can grow easily, and they need good oxygen in the water. They like to have a lot of bugs there, so you have to have a, usually a good tree canopy and a healthy creek. So they're kind of an indicator species for our creeks as to whether they're healthy or not. And we do uh, have that kind of habitat in Mission Creek, so that's, you know, we may ask, well, why are we spending all this money and doing all these projects on Mission Creek? And it's because for a number of reasons. First, we have an existing trout or rainbow trout population or steelhead, same, same thing in the upper watershed of Mission Creek. Uh, we have historic documented runs of, of steelhead trout, and so um, we know that they were there in the past. Um, we do have some very good quality habitat, like Rick talked about, especially on um, Rattlesnake Creek and in the mid to upper watershed. We have year-round water, which means the fish have a place to over summer once they do spawn, and the estuary is actually not that bad. We have seen some smolts there, and they can over summer there also. And so for all those reasons, also we have, um, NOAA has uh, designated that Mission Creek out of all the South Coast streams, it, uh, steelhead are an endangered species. The Southern California steelhead is a, is a, is a specific subspecies, I guess, and that is endangered. And uh, they've done a big recovery plan for that. In that recovery plan, they've identified Mission Creek as a core one population. I don't know exactly what that means, but it means that it's kind of special. There's only four of those in the South Coast, and, and basically they're indicating that this is the, the creek that would be good to spend our resources on for, um, for uh, restoration compared to some of the other South Coast streams. And here's a picture of them. Also, we've seen steelhead try to migrate. In 2008 was the last time we saw uh, quite a few, uh, six different uh, steelhead. These are pictures of some of them, anywhere from 26 to 32 inches long. So we saw some big fish. They were all trapped downstream of the downstream barriers that were in the process of trying to remove. And I'll, and I'll show you that location. And uh, so that's, you know, here's just some photos of them. And that's, that's why we're doing it. I just wanted to thank and list the project partners that have helped us on these projects, uh, these fish passage projects. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife used to be Fish and Game, Wildlife Conservation Board, the State Coastal Conservancy, NOAA, um, Santa Barbara County Flood Control District, Santa Barbara Foundation, the Environmental Defense Center, the Annenberg Foundation, and COM, or Kachum Operations and Maintenance Board. So we've had a lot of people assist us with this. So I'm going to go over the project locations. This right here is the watershed, Mission Creek. It comes out here by the harbor. Uh, I'll go from upstream to downstream. The upstream barrier that we've been working on is here at the Highway 192 bridge. The next one in line is the Talent Road bridge. Then we get to the Caltrans channel. We consider that one barrier, but it's actually two different locations. The, the, it's the Caltrans channels. There's two of them. Uh, they're 0.3 miles long, the upper channel, and 0.8 miles long, the lower channel, and they're separated by a natural section. Now we're down here to the ocean. Um, I'm going to start from the upper watershed and work my way down. Highway 192 bridge, here's a photo of it. You see this large concrete there. That's what prevents the fish from jumping or swimming upstream. There's concrete that goes towards the bridge also. This creates conditions. The, the thing that fish don't like are high velocities, shallow water, um, um, and that's, and, or high jumps that they can't get over. And so those are what create barriers. And these places at bridges often have all three. It's a very, very high jump. The water's flowing very fast over the concrete. And it's often shallow at low to medium flows. So the fish cannot travel upstream. 
We've, uh, we worked on this project with State Coastal Conservancy in the county initially to do some preliminary plans. Then we went to final design with a grant from Fish and Game. And we found during that process that there was a large water line that the comb was uh, looking at replacing. So at that point, we finished the final design and turned it, turned it over to comb to implement as part of their water line replacement. They're right now in the permits of perm, uh, in the they're in the process of finishing their permitting, and um, they have submitted a fund a grant to Fish and Wildlife, and if they get that grant, they should have enough funds to go to construction in 2013. So Talent Bridge, Talent Road Bridge, is very similar to the Highway 192 Bridge, same kind of barrier except more concrete. We removed this barrier. Actually, we've completed that. And so I'll show you some of this, but you can see it's very tall. It's like six to eight feet high. You got concrete all there for the same reasons. This is a fish passage barrier. We did project design, and basically that involves removing all the concrete, relocating the sewer line, constructing some weirs and pools and riffles in order to uh, kind of recreate a natural stream bed and, and give some areas for the fish to rest. And then we did some restoration with planting. Um, we completed this project in November 2011. You can see here we're building a weir uh, out of large rock, and there's a tractor in the contract. There's a bridge in the background, and uh, that was all finished in November 2010, and the project looked good, but we did have a, few, a, a, a small area downstream where we lost some cobble during a large storm event, so we had to come back this last summer and repair that, and those repairs are done. So the total cost of the project was $955,000. We got funding from Fish and Wildlife, State Coastal Conservancy, NOAA, and then city funds, both City Creeks Division and Wastewater, because Wastewater assisted with the sewer line replacement, I mean uh, relocation. Here's a picture of the, of the channel when it was all completed. So it looks nice and restored. It's all natural now. And uh, when we stabilize that downstream section, it's working very well at this point. We just haven't had any rain. <laughs> So next we'll move on to the, the thing we're trying to focus on tonight, which are the Caltrans channels. This is just an overview photo of it. Here's the project design. We did, we have completed construction of the upper channel. And uh, we did a bunch of modeling and computer and physical modeling in order to find out what the best design was. And this was what we came up with, most cost effective and best for the fish. It's a four foot wide channel. It's three to three and a half feet deep. Every 50 or every, yeah, every 40 feet, there's these resting areas. They're 10 feet long. They're cut into the side of the channel. They allow the fish to rest on their upstream migration. These small bumps you see here are speed bumps, they kind of look like. They're 18-inch sills, we call them. And they help to increase the depth in the channel. So again, we're trying to get depth. We're trying to slow the water down for the fish. And we're trying to give them some resting areas in a location, as you can tell here, all concrete. If this water were here, it'd be about an inch deep be flowing all across it. There'd be no resting areas and no way for a fish to swim up. So that's the project design. We're doing the same thing on both the upper and lower channel. Again, two phases of construction due to the large nature of the project. The upper channel was completed in 2012. We're doing the lower channel this summer if everything goes well. Uh, here's a few photos of construction. They're removing the concrete bed here. On the upper channel, they're digging the, the fishway right here. And then you can see them pouring the concrete and doing the forms for replacing uh, that section of forming the fishway and replacing the concrete. Here's a completed picture of the project. There's the sills again, rest pockets, low flow fishway. Um, the cost for the upper section was $1,268,000. We got funds again from Fish and Wildlife, who've been really helping us all along on this project, of one million, about a million dollars. And then the Creeks Division Capital supplied about $268,000. We did some monitoring to see how effective the upper channel was. Unfortunately, we haven't got any big rain events. We were prepared this year to do modeling, I mean, monitoring on big rain events, but it, it hasn't happened. And the year before, we were able to do some lower flow events, and the fish passage fishway worked exactly as we had modeled it. We got nice low velocities for the fish in the, in the channel. We got good depths, and we didn't have much sedimentation in the channel, which, was, which is important to the long-term maintenance and effectiveness of it. Here's a photo of the lower channel. Uh, it's just the same as the upper channel. It's a little wider in some, in, in some sections but, and a little deeper, but it's basically the same, looks the same. And uh, we'll use the same design again in that project in order to, uh, to get the fish upstream. It's a much longer channel, so it's more expensive. It's 0.8 miles long as opposed to 0.3. 
The construction contract that we've got a bid for was $2,824,000. We added 10% for a change order in case something comes up that we didn't foresee that we have some money to pay for that. We have construction support. This is our design um, engineer has to be around to answer questions and to overview the construction. We have other construction costs such as surveying and testing of the concrete and compaction tests and things like that of 55,000. And then construction management is paid to our public's work department to oversee all of the construction. That totals $3,466,000 $100, or $125. So it's a pretty, pretty big chunk of money. Um, but this again is more of a maximum, just so you guys know. We don't anticipate costs to go any higher than this. We've kind of built in some, some emergency backup funds if we need to. So hopefully it'll come in less than this. That's our hopes. Here's the funds we've, we're gonna use to pay for it. Department of Fish and Wildlife, again, a big grant from them, $1,735,000. Wildlife Conservation Board, seven seventy-five. dollars State Coastal Conservancy, $300,000. The Park Foundation, Santa Barbara Foundation through the Park Foundation was $75,000. Uh, Creeks Capital, four ninety-six. dollars right now we have there for it that was already budgeted for the project. And then we have the Creeks Reserve amount. That's the remaining, that was kind of the hole that was left over that we didn't have funded. And so that's what we need to get from Creeks Reserve to have all the money available should we need it, should we need to spend all that contingency, all those contingency funds. So our recommendation tonight that we'd like to get from the committee is that we appropriate $84,542 from the Creeks Reserve Fund to the Mission Creek Fish Passage Project, Phase 2, Lower Caltrans Channel, and that we proceed with Phase 2 construction on the Lower Channel this summer. And uh, I think that's it. We've got all our permits. We're ready to go. We've got a contractor. We just want to get these funds appropriated, and we'll go to city council with your recommendation if if you give it to us and should be ready to construct. So any questions? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, by, by way of a question, uh, I would move to uh, appropriate $84,000 uh, plus for phase two of the Lower Mission Creek for the project uh, as described. And um, I would like to thank Mr. Uh, Johnson for tracking this so well over the years. Uh, last week on Valentine's Day, uh, they had a ribbon cutting for the uh, Campbell Bridge of the Botanic Garden. There were a couple hundred donors and supporters there. And uh, there was a lot of talk before and after the ceremony about people who were excited uh, about the chance to see Mission Creek come alive again um, uh, with fish and all the, all the comments were positive. So I hope I get a second to my motion. Gladly second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I have a question though. George, can I ask you two questions? Sure. Um, is the same contractor doing the work on the lower channel that did on the upper channel? No. Okay. A different contractor because the city's required to put everything out to bid and it's always the low bidder. And the uh, contractor who did the first phase we anticipated would uh, submit a bid, but they didn't submit a bid, so a different uh, contractor came in with a low bid. Okay. Thank you. And then my second question may be simplistic, but I don't know the answer to it. Um, I understand that salmon, when they spawn, go back to the stream or the river where they were hatched. Yes. Still head the same, or will they go to a different... Now this one's open, will we start to see? The, as far as I've been told, they do go to different streams. They're not as fixated on going back to the same exact stream. I think they do prefer it, but that they will travel up other streams. And, and, and so that's kind of the difference between a steelhead, and that's what's important about these. There's, there are some streams that still have steelhead in, in Central California and even a few in Southern California, so we... We hope that some of those fish will make their way down here and go up the stream. And that, you know, that's that's as much as I know. I'm not an expert in it, but what I've been told is that yes, they do they do go up streams that they weren't born in okay. to spawn. And then maybe this would maybe Natasha would answer this maybe, but um, would we um, uh, plant the stream with stock? With eggs? I mean, no, there is co there is uh, there has been lots of talk about that amongst the people doing fish restoration, but at this point. Uh, I don't think the permitting agencies would even allow us to do stocking. Um, it's it's controversial. It may may work, but at this point, 
they don't feel that the the species in, is that dire, like the condors where they had to remove them from the wild and then replant them. So I, I don't anticipate doing anything like that in the near future. Maybe long term, but not right now. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I had a question about item number nine. Uh, I, I was wondering whether the chair would uh, entertain as part of a motion to adjourn uh, a, a special thank you to uh, our outgoing chair for two years of distinguished uh, successful service uh, and uh, my personal enthusiasm for our new chair and vice chair uh, for uh, another year or two uh, where they try to match uh, uh, Paul's level of success. Uh, and with that, I'd like to move we consider adjourning. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. All in favor? All right.